Welcome to the Alpha Concepts Podcast, where we'll talk about everything going on in the gun culture, from training to gear and gun rights advocacy. Hi, I'm Thomas Crawl, and I'll be your host for this adventure. And in today's podcast, we're talking with Ron Carter. Ron Carter is uh, an instructor. He's uh, a board member with a group called Save the Second. And I uh, wanted to introduce everybody in the world to Ron and what he's got going on. Ron, say hi. Hey, guys. How are you? I'm doing fine, Ron. Thanks for spending the time here with me today. Um, so tell me about yourself. Tell the listeners uh, about who you are, what you've got going on. Let us uh, let us get to know you. Oh, man, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a normal guy in Colorado, right? I'm a normal guy that loves firearms and everything revolving firearms. I, I started this this passionate affair with the love of firearms when I was growing up in the middle of nowhere, Arkansas. Uh, so I grew up just outside of Stettgard, Arkansas, which is known to be the rice and duck capital of the world. Spent a lot of time growing up uh, duck hunting, deer hunting, turkey hunting. If there's, if there's something hunting, I was doing it when I was growing up. I enlisted in the Arkansas Army National Guard when you know, I turned 17, actually, on my birthday. I had mom and dad sign the dotted line because I was not yet 18. Went off to basic training where I got to play with some really fun firearms. Now, of course, at that time, this was 2003, it was still kind of the old school BDU, Battle Dress Uniform, Army. And so I, I learned more bad habits with firearms than I learned good habits. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Uh, so it, it wasn't until uh, I you know, got out, became a you know, full civilian, DD-214, full civilian, got married, started having a family that I thought, you know, I should really be able to protect myself and my family in my house. And so, of course, I, I had a few rifles, but, well, rifles aren't exactly the the end-all, be-all, right? They're not exactly portable. You can't conceal and carry a, you know, a full 16-inch you know, rifle. So I purchased a handgun. Uh, r- right around the 2011-2012 time frame, I purchased my first handgun. And with that purchase of a handgun, I realized that I had a learning curve, you know, that I was very proficient with the rifles, but I was terrible with the handgun sure. comparatively. So I, was, I started taking a lot of courses, uh, and beyond just taking training, my love for firearms grew to the point where I wanted to start actually being around them all the time. So I started volunteering at a local FFL, you know, gun shop mm-hmm. here in Colorado Springs. I started shooting competitively. And then I started getting credentials <laughs> because that's, that's the natural progression. Once you're, you're head first into the deep end of the pool, well, you got to become a, a credentialed instructor. So uh, for many of us, the way that we cut our teeth as being instructors is we go and obtain our first NRA certified training credentials. And uh, I believe my first one, yeah, my first one was range safety officer. Same. And I became basic, basic pistol. And yeah, the, the list keeps growing. I'm rifle, shotgun. You know, pistol inside the home, personal protection, personal protection inside the home, I should say. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's where I'm at now, and and now I'm still teaching. I teach a, quite a bit, uh, but beyond that, I'm also still a student. In fact, tomorrow I'm taking a dynamic carving course with Osprey Shooting Solutions. So you know, it, it doesn't end, man. It's it's a hobby, but it's a lifestyle, and obviously, it's uh, beneficial in the protection of myself and my family. I like what you said about uh, you're a teacher, but you're also a student, and that's uh, incredibly important, I think, for everyone to understand. I know all the good instructors will think the same as you, that uh, you're still a student and you're always learning. And the saying I like to say is when you stop pushing forward, you're falling behind because everyone else is, keeps on pushing. So that's uh, great to keep on learning because uh, things do change. Not much, but, you know, there are occasionally new valid techniques and there's occasionally new uh, quality gear. And, and we've, got to, uh, we've got to try those things out as instructors to be able to pass that knowledge along to our students. Plus, even if we're not learning anything new and we're just uh, – 
reinforcing skills that we already uh, know, we've, we have to stop to sharpen our knives, so to speak. If you're a butcher and you're constantly cutting meat all day, eventually those knives go dull and you have to stop and resharpen, uh, resharpen the knife, resharpen the skills. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, you're keeping on with your, with your training. I try to do the same. Um, uh, my, my progression was similar to yours, started range safety officer, basic pistol, personal protection. And, uh, recently I jumped over into USCCA and I started getting some of their certifications, uh, as well, just to kind of, uh, piggyback and, and double up. It's like you said, it's, uh, it's a progression and you just keep collecting them like uh, baseball cards. Oh, absolutely. 100%. And, you know, I, I'm one of those guys that always enjoys getting the next, have or the next accomplishment, you know, and setting goals, uh, and not only in the instructor side of things, but you know, e even in the competition side of things. Uh, this past Independence Day, July Fourth, I got to shoot a two-gun match where I came in third nice. over all in my division, and you know, <laughs> I'm setting that bar high. Like I, I really want to be in in that that top tier of competition. You know, iron sharpens iron, and that competition side is another avenue of uh, a way that you can set goals and and see improvements and yeah man i i i cannot be complacent complacency is a killer so i'm always pressing forward okay so you mentioned competition shooting and uh, i know that your background was uh hunting and um uh, you know, you said you got into handguns and, and home defense. So uh, from a defensive shooter point of view, uh, can I'm going to ask you a two-part question. Can competition uh, teach a defensive shooter anything? And also, are there any bad habits that a defensive shooter can pick up from competition? Oh, man, that, that's such a, an area that I focus on quite a bit. Yes, there are loads of of things that you can take from competition and apply to defensive application. For example, if you can't get the gun in the fight, it's worthless. And so on that timer, usually getting that gun into the fight, like within IDPA, International Defensive Pistol Association, uh, hey, you have to have a solid, quick draw. If you can get the gun in the fight, but you can't hit what you need to, it's worthless. You have to have that, that accuracy and having that timer is certainly an added stress. And finally, if you can get the gun in the fight and hit what you need to, but you fail to do so before the threat gets to you, then it was all worthless. And so if you're looking at competition and you're just you're comparing where you sit among the rankings, you can say, wow, I was third, and the two top guys, if they were threats to me, they would have been faster and they might have been more lethal and you know, I might have lost that fight. Now, on the other hand, there's, you know, several bad habits that you can get into. Uh, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit. We get into habit. You, you set in your car, you already know how to start your car, and so you start your car without even thinking about it. The next time you get in a different car, you know, somebody else's car, or perhaps a new car, you're kind of lost. You don't know exactly how to start it without devoting conscious thought. And similarly, we get into this these patterns, these habits, and so if you get into the habit of emptying and showing clear just as soon as you stopped your, your shooting on your course and you apply that to real life, you know, you, you empty and show clear, you know, when you think the threat's done, but the threat's not done, well, you just have an empty gun. Right, so you that's unloaded an in the middle of a gunfight, and that's not a winning strategy. Right, absolutely, and we're creatures of habit. Now, I'm not saying that, that people can't, you know, remove that, that sort of habitual nature, but it's very easy to revert to your last – you know, training or the last experience that you had with that handgun. If you're not scanning and assessing, you know, heck, there could be a you know a threat behind you. So you know, we we don't do that in you know like IDPA. You don't go 360 degrees, you know, searching for additional threats. And so a lot of people will get that tunnel vision on a, on a singular threat and not realize that there are additional threats. So breaking that tunnel vision, breaking those those habits of competition, is probably one thing that could be detrimental to a defensive encounter. Still, the lessons that you're able to learn by working the gun, driving the gun, pushing your limits of speed and accuracy, that's invaluable. 
Yeah, I, I agree that there's definitely some, uh, like anything, pros and cons. And uh, as long as you're aware of what those drawbacks, what those negatives potentially could be, then you're able to uh, train around them. And uh, one thing that you mentioned uh, about competing against the other shooters, um, I, you know, in my basic entry-level classes, concealed carry and whatnot, I will tell people, I go out and get some additional advanced training, go out and join a league, get some competition, and who cares if you win or lose? You're competing against yourself, not the other people. Take your concealed carry gun out there and just get some some trigger time and some stress and, and um you know, compete against yourself until you really start getting good and then worry about the other shooters. But from now, you know, do a few competitions and don't worry what your score is. Just do one, then do the second one. And, and did you get better? Uh, what, what can you improve on? You're able to uh, prove your gear, uh, which I think is important because a lot of people will make a, uh, an emotional attachment to their gear. And then for whatever reason, they don't want to admit that it might not be the best choice and um, you have to prove your gear. Make sure it works the way you've intended. And then also, you know, again, you're, you're getting some trigger time. And the more trigger time, uh, the better. Not, not enough people get enough trigger time. And so when you can get the competition, it's fun. It doesn't seem like a chore anymore. It's not just going to the range and standing still, poking holes in paper. You're actually able to shoot on the move and rapid fire and things that uh, you don't get to do unless you have a private range or, or take a defensive class or something like that. So I think everyone should at least do, you know, a little competition here and there. Um, and I also think that people shouldn't worry too much about the competitors until they get serious about it. That's just my two cents. Dude, I, I totally agree. 100% agree. And hey, if you can get into that culture of just hanging around other shooters, I mean, you're going to learn so much just by the association of seeing somebody else shoot and then, you know, testing your gear. Oh my gosh, that's a huge one. There's, uh, heck, Murphy and Murphy's Law is alive and well. And I guarantee you what can go wrong will go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I want the failures to happen on the range or in competition, not when my life is depending upon it. Exactly. When you have the luxury of time, obviously, yeah, seconds count in competition, but they count even more when it's a life and death uh, fight out on the streets. Absolutely. So I would like you to tell me about Save the Second. What is that? So Save the Second is a nonprofit that I assisted with starting uh, last year in, I guess it was late May, early June. Uh, yeah, so... NRA, National Rifle Association of America, it has some major problems. And I'm not talking about, you know, some some silly, you know, states where they're failing. I'm talking about across the board. It's been a, just a, a domino effect of one bad decision after another. I, I first was kind of alerted to that when the carry guard program came out, which was completely contradictory to what the NRA had done with their training and education, uh, carry guard was, oh my gosh, it was cringeworthy. Uh, started as an insurance platform that copied almost verbatim USCCA. And then they interjected their own training, which was hilariously unsafe. In the videos that I saw of their training, they had you know students running around, literally running around with a handgun, finger on the trigger, no muzzle discipline. I mean, just, as a range safety officer, I'm like, oh, my God, what is this a joke? No, it wasn't a joke. So that was my first introduction in, in 20, late 2016, early 2017 of carry guard and, and you know, just the, the ball of suck and fail that it was. Well, it turns out there was a lot more going on that was just absolutely terrible. Uh, yeah, to, to give you an, um, a little bit more, now the NRA – is facing several multi-million dollar lawsuits against its former advertising agency, Ackerman McQueen. It has a lawsuit against the former NRA president, Oliver North, investigations by the New York Attorney General, investigation by the D.C. Attorney General, charges from the New York Department of Financial Services, and, just, and then more. I mean, it, do, it doesn't stop there. The NRA could absolutely cease to exist. The New York Attorney General could revoke its tax exempt status, and then the NRA becomes entirely impotent. But what's more than that, they're spending money out the wazoo, money they don't have now, 
uh, at, in January, we learned it was $100 million that they had spent in the legal defense, just the legal defense, uh, in regards to the New York Attorney General's investigation. $100 million. Now, that's even worse considering there was leaked information last year about this time about the NRA Executive Vice President and CEO, Wayne LaPierre, having spent money, member dues and donations, that were potentially embezzled through the advertising agency, Akram McQueen, $270,000 worth in clothes, dress suits. So there's just, just a laundry list of, of problems that need to be addressed within the NRA, not only on the, the training and education side, but where the money is going, why, why these problems are not being uh, you know, answered for. Who, who's taking responsibility? Is there accountability? There isn't any. So I reached out to some friends of mine that, that were intimately familiar with the NRA, and I said, hey, we've got to do something. I don't know what it is. I don't know how we can rally members. we got to do something. Well, one of the guys that I reached out to is Anthony Garcia. He's the president of Save the Second. He was extremely useful. Well, I shouldn't say useful. He was ex- exceptionally talented in the 2013 recalls of state congressmen here in Colorado regarding the magazine limit- limitation that was uh, passed through the legislature. And two of the uh, four uh, congressmen that they were going after were recalled, first time in history uh, in the state of Colorado that you know anybody in Congress and the, the state legislature had been recalled. So I reached out to him. He's a an NRA benefactor, life member. And he's like, okay, well, uh, you know, we need a nonprofit. Let's do a nonprofit. So we started to think of names for the nonprofit, you know, like Save the NRA or you know, something of that nature. And we realized quickly that the NRA had previously sued people that used even a remote likeness of their name, NRA anywhere in there or something like that. So we had to be creative. We had to, to use something else other than Save the NRA or Members for Accountability or something like that. So we finally went with Save the Second because it's our belief that the NRA, if it is reformed and is doing what it needs to do, then it's our best hope of truly saving and expanding the Second Amendment. As it is right now, that's that's certainly not the case. So that's that's where Save the Second originated, where we came from. Uh, we have four goals now that we completed one, uh, one of the five, I should say. We have four left. We want a smaller NRA board of directors. We want term limits for the board of directors. We want the board of directors to engage the membership and have the membership engage the board of directors. And finally, we want the NRA to have an exclusive Second Amendment focus. Yeah, I think those are uh, I think those are novel goals. Um, I think that uh, definitely, you know, I don't have the answers on on how to fix what's going on over there, but I'm glad that people are uh, addressing and identifying that there are issues. It's not uh, it's not, not all peaches and cream, and um, you know, so save the seconds goal is not to replace the NRA, correct? Correct. Absolutely. We, we want to make the NRA what it's supposed to be. We want to make it better. We want to make it efficient. We want to make it accountable uh, and successful, of course. So, yeah, we're, we're not in the, the market to try to, to destroy it and replace it with something. In fact, you're trying to improve it and better it. 100%. Now, don't get me wrong. There's loads of excellent Second Amendment you know, style organizations out there. Uh, yeah, I'm a member of Firearms Policy Coalition, Gun Owners of America. I mean, those are great. We need each and every one, and we need you know gun owners of America, the gun owners, to support as many of those entities as they can. But still, the NRA is is just a walking soup sandwich, and we've got to address that and fix it for the betterment of all citizens of the United States. So. When, whenever I'm critical, you get on social media and, and say something, uh, uh, you know, critical about uh, the happenings over there at the, the NRA, um, I'm always accused of being an NRA hater. And, and I tell people all the time, I say that, you know, that's the furthest thing from the truth. I wouldn't criticize if I didn't care. And what do you say to people when they accuse you of, of hating the NRA or, or they'll maybe mention some of the good? And the NRA does a lot of good. Both, we, we agree, correct? I mean, you know, Absolutely. they have their 
their faults, but they've accomplished quite a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so we have to acknowledge that for sure. It would be unfair if we didn't. It's, uh, you know, but at the same point in time, I don't think, and tell me if you agree, I don't, I don't think that we should excuse the problems just because of the good that they've done. I think that uh, I tell people all the time uh, from a, like a political point of view when we're talking about politicians, the most patriotic thing you can do is question uh, politicians. The most patriotic thing you can do is hold their feet to the fire and keep them accountable, especially if you voted for them. We, no free rides. And I think that philosophy applies to organizations that we may support as well. You know, I'm a life member of the NRA, NRA instructor, NRA recruiter, but I haven't recruited anyone in quite a while because in good conscience, I just, you know, I, I couldn't stand there in front of people with a straight face and say, you should join the NRA. You know, I, now I tell them, hey, if you feel like they're uh, representing you, then you should join the NRA. But I, I don't, you know, push and promote it like I like I used to until I really look forward to the day when these problems are corrected, when the leadership, it's not the NRA that, that I'm necessarily upset with, right? It's the leadership of the NRA because we, the members, are the organization. It's the leadership over there that's screwing it up for us. And I look forward to the day where... Um, I will stand in front of my students uh, and uh, and promote you know the NRA to each and every one of them and say, hey, you know this is the organization that is defending your rights. And yes, they do that, but not like they used to. And one other thing I want you to touch on, which I agree with 100%, is you said that you want the NRA to be a single issue, a Second Amendment organization. Tell me about some of the things that they've said or done, that the leadership has said or done that uh, is not related to the Second Amendment that you don't necessarily agree with? Oh, my gosh. Uh, there's there's so much there. Uh, so let, let's look here recently, a recent example. Uh, this latest issue of uh, Freedom First or the First Freedom uh, NRA publication has a picture of Eric Trump on the cover. And that that just strikes me as completely odd. You see, within the past three and a half years of President Trump's administration, administration, we have seen more anti-gun legislation than in the eight years of President Obama. If you have a bump stock right now, you're a felon. <laughs> okay, the, the, True gun banning. And th this isn't even necessarily a gun. This is a plastic part. A, a piece of plastic now makes you a felon. And previous to the election of President Trump, Eric... Trump had gone and made several videos with silencer co, you know, with, with their silencers and promoting the Hearing Protection Act, which would have removed silencers from the National Firearms Act, the NFA. Oh my gosh, you know, it, in, in 2016, I was salivating at that opportunity. I thought it was the greatest thing. And yet, here we are today with more anti gun legislation. And instead of trying to hold, you know, these politicians accountable for their promises, you know, the attack on your Second Amendment rights is over. Instead of, instead of, you know, the NRA saying, hey, listen, we're not getting what we voted for. Instead of that, they're simply promoting, you know, the, the politicians. And that's, that's exceptionally contradictory to me, because if you're a true Second Amendment absolutist, then there's, there's a problem there with that political leadership. And so if you're a Second Amendment organization, well, that, that's something that you should be calling to light, that, oh, my gosh, bump stocks are a piece of plastic, and they shouldn't be defined as a machine gun, and, and so on. So that, that's a recent example of, of how the NRA, I think, has, has really become more of a political entity, you know, focused on, uh, say, the Republican Party, than they are the Second Amendment. They're straying from where they you know, have their roots in 1871, focusing on the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Oh, yeah. Now, I, I, have, I have hope that we can see the NRA return to that focus. Ultimately, it will take the membership of the NRA hounding their board of directors and hounding the executive vice president and showing up at the members meeting in, in uh, Springfield, Missouri, September 5th, 
to, to see these goals happen. And I'm, I'm like you, I really, I, I pray for the day that I can say, you know what? The NRA is amazing right now. It's not. I think the theme for today is kicking a hornet's nest because you just kicked a hefty one by insulting the president. I know that, uh, there's going to be, uh, quite a few listeners who are punching their phones and their their computers right now because of uh, what you said. And uh, I'm not one of them. I think that, um, you know, there are definitely some issues there as well that uh, probably is a topic for a completely other podcast. And uh, I have uh, hope and faith that, uh, you know, uh, things will return to the promises that we were told. And, uh, you know, the Hearing Protection Act would have been a wonderful thing to pass. It wouldn't have made a, a lick of difference in Illinois since they're still illegal at a state level. But, you know, I support all gun rights and, uh, um, yeah, bump stocks and the fixed nicks and uh, all these things are definitely uh, abominations. I think uh, uh, our mutual friend Rob Pincus once said that... Uh, uh, every single gun law is a crime against humanity. And I don't know if he made it up or not, but it's it's the damn truth. So I, I think we have to oppose every single gun law. It doesn't matter if it's originating from the left or from the right. I don't care if it's a law or if it's a regulation because, you know, people are quick to point out. I'm sure someone's going to say, well, bump stocks aren't a law. You know, that's just a regulation. And, you know, we're really just splitting hairs when we have those kinds of conversations. We've, we've got to hold the uh, people accountable you know, the people that are responsible, we've got to hold them accountable. I don't care who they are. You know, again, if you voted for this guy, then you need to to let him know that you weren't pleased with those actions. Um, and, I, you know, I guess, uh, thank God for small favors. We haven't seen any attacks lately. And then, of course, there's going to be the those people who say, well, he's better than Hillary. He's better than Biden. And, yeah, I mean, but let's be honest that uh, – Biden and Hillary have set the bar very, very low. So, um, you know, that that just is what it is. So um, save the second. Your goal is to reform the NRA, not replace the NRA. You have clearly defined objectives uh, on, on how to achieve that. You said you've got one of the five uh, achieved. Which was the one? I know you mentioned them all, but which was the one that you said has been achieved? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mention that. Director attendance. So there's 76 NRA board of directors. That's a lot. Problem is, half of them hardly ever show up to the board meetings. Uh, there's one in particular that has been elected and now re-elected. He's going on his fourth year as a board of director. He's never once attended a board meeting. He's not even been sworn in. Okay? <laughs> so that's kind of a problem. And we, we addressed that. We, we formulated a petition uh, to address that, and we actually saw it somewhat come into fruition at the January NRA Board of Directors meeting. Uh, it wasn't exactly what we had hoped. We had hoped to mit amend the bylaws of the NRA. Instead, the uh, nominate, I'm sorry, the uh, bylaws committee, uh, they, they took our uh, petition and they said, okay, well, we can make this a policy. We can make director attendance a policy so we don't have to, you know, go through the rigmarole of amending the NRA bylaws. And so we actually saw them enact a director attendance policy in January. So, you know, that that's a win for us. If we can hold our directors accountable and actually have them show up and do what they're supposed to right. do as our elected <laughs> directors, which, by the way, I mean, the, the membership of the NRA elects the board of directors. Hey, what's so, the percentage know, of uh, voting uh, with the uh, the members voting? Obviously, you either have to be a five year member or a life member to vote. Well, do you have that statistic? How many NRA members who are eligible to vote actually do vote? So we just came out with the results from this previous election. However, we haven't seen the actual tabulation who voted and whatnot in last year's election in 2019. The uh, NRA's elections committee saw that they had mailed 2.4 million ballots to voting eligible members, and only 145,000 returned those. That's 6%, a little less than 6% of voting eligible members actually voted in 2019. So you've got 94% of NRA voting eligible members that did not vote. That's you know, absurd to me. That's that's 
that's flabbergasting. I don't know how, how else to explain that. So I, honestly, I think we're going to see that very similar statistic uh, come out once the, the tabulation uh, is released for this 2020 election, but 6% voted in 2019. Now, do you believe, I mean, do you think that members don't know? Do you think that members don't care? Do you, maybe they don't know there's problems. What, what do you think, apathy, what's the cause in your opinion, of the lack of participation? You know, honestly, I think it's very similar to what we experience with with handgun students. You know, if a never, ever handgun owner, uh, you know, finally gets a, a handgun and comes and takes a concealed carry course, he simply doesn't know what he doesn't know. And so you have to really start that that student at the beginning and explain to him the four rules of firearm safety and, and then basic you know, marksmanship and, and so on and so forth, how to load the gun, how to clean the gun, everything. I think we have so many NRA members that simply support the NRA because they've done great things in the past and they have that reputation. They've been around since 1871. They are the National Rifle Association. And so they have this this faith that the NRA is is perfect and they're doing what they need to. They simply don't know what they don't know. And I guarantee you, if there is corruption within the leadership of the NRA, the last thing that they want is for the regular member to know that. Sure. And, yeah, they're not going to go around broadcasting that information. And then it, it's up to people like you to do that. And then you're, you know, taking all the heat because, you, you know, don't kill the messenger, so to speak, and you're the messenger. And uh, it's it's unfortunate because, uh, like you said, the uh, – the members elect the board. The board is supposed to be accountable. Currently, they uh, are kind of, in my opinion, figureheads mostly. It seems like the executives are the ones that are making the bulk of the decisions. And no one has elected Wayne LaPierre. It's just been something that, uh, you know, he got uh, uh, appointed through, uh, you know, his uh politicking within the organization and that's how he uh, retains power and that's uh that's you know unfortunate i don't care if he stays or goes personally uh you know right the ship that's the way i look at it you know if it, we need a new captain then we need a new captain if the, this captain can uh, get things back on track then let's just get things back on track one way or the other so that uh, we can restore the power that the organization once had you know it's um it's, it, it's, it's unfortunate that the NRA isn't quite as powerful as it used to be because it's sidelined by all these issues that you had mentioned with the lawsuits and, and whatnot, that it's got to spend all that money, time, and resources in that arena and not uh, where it's supposed to be, which is uh, uh, defending the Second Amendment. Absolutely, man. And, you know, to, to be frank and, and, and not to, to beat a dead horse, going back to the, the president, I 100% support President Trump, Okay. I, I absolutely do. I hope he would, you know, do better things, especially for the Second Amendment. But I support him. And likewise, I support Wayne LaPierre. I want him to be the most awesome CEO slash executive vice president that the NRA has ever seen. I want him to be amazing because if the NRA is amazing, my rights are more secure. My rights get expanded. Unfortunately, it's the opposite. He's not He's not owning it. He's not uh, – is not moving forward. It's that complacency, right? It, once you get complacent, are you really progressing? Are you making yourself better? As a student, right, if you're not continually practicing and trying to sharpen that edge, then you're moving backwards. And that's exactly where I see Wayne LaPierre currently. He's had 30-plus years as the CEO slash executive vice president. And what have we seen for it? We've seen, well, during his time, of course, we saw the the assault weapons ban in 1994. Thankfully, that sunset. So, I mean, that's not a, a problem anymore, but it could be. Bump stocks are gone. We don't have national reciprocity. There's so many problems that, that need a strong drive and a driver that will see it accomplished. And I'm not seeing Wayne LaPierre do that. But by God, if tomorrow he knocks it out of the park, I'll be singing his praises. Right, because to to hope and wish that the captain of the ship fails is kind of ridiculous because it means that uh, the ship's going to be sinking and we're going to be sinking with it. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of ridiculous to, to wish such a thing. And, and, of course, I don't think that you do. I just want anyone who might be listening to understand that, you know, to be critical 
um, is it doesn't mean you care. It means the exact opposite. I mean, it doesn't mean you don't care. It means the exact opposite. Of course, of course you care. You wouldn't be uh, uh, contributing all this energy to the cause. So uh, is there anything else you want to add? What do you have going on? Uh, tell us about your training school, uh, where anyone might be able to get a hold of you. Um, just what's going on in your world otherwise? Oh, man, I'm on the interwebs all the time, uh, particularly Facebook. I'm on Facebook so much. Of course, let's save the second. We've, we've, got a, <laughs> we've definitely got to have some analysis on the elections that, that came out or the election results for the NRA Board of Directors that came out yesterday. There's a lot there that just shocks me, and then there's a lot that, that really gives me hope. So, yeah, we're, we're going to have a, a nice podcast on that probably on Monday. Of course, uh, with say the second, you know, when, when we have information to share, we try to share that through the podcast, and we stream that, you know, through Facebook and YouTube, and you know your favorite podcast app, which I'm sure your listeners are <laughs> you're getting very accustomed to. Uh, other than that, uh, we have a Facebook group, Friends of Save the Second, where you can absolutely tell me that I'm wrong and why I'm wrong, and I will absolutely listen to you. So please tell me I'm wrong. Let's get better together. Iron sharpens iron. As far as training is co- concerned, I love Osprey Shooting Solutions. I love Knoss Tech Group. They're local here in Colorado Springs. Uh, I don't get up to Denver very often, but occasionally. Uh, if you ever want to shoot Colorado 3-Gun, Southern Colorado 3-Gun or SoCo 3-Gun uh, shoots quite a bit. You can check out their schedule on the website. I shoot IDPA a lot. And similarly, Front Range IDPA uh, has all of their match times. You can come and shoot with me because I love shooting with awesome folks. So please come and shoot with me. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what's going on. I'm, I'm uh, also instructing occasionally, I think I've got three dates here in this month now, with elite firearms and training here in Colorado Springs. My good friend Ava Flanell owns and operates that. And she asked me to come and help her. And oh, by God, I love love assisting awesome instructors like herself yeah man that's what's going on and this afternoon i'm going to install a new safe i just bought a new safe and i'm super excited to stuff it with all of my my goodies yeah (laughs) with all of your goodies it's like uh it's like an addiction whenever anyone buys their first gun i tell them all the time welcome to the addiction because that you, whatever safe you buy, you're going to want to get a bigger one. I promise that. Oh, 100%. And, and then, then it takes a step beyond that because now I've got to have a lot more ammo because I'm shooting a lot more. So I've, you know, I've got my progressive press and my, my single-stage press so I can crank out hand loads and, and lots of them so I can shoot more. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's an addiction for real. All right, well, we're going to wrap things up right about here. Ron, I thank you so much for uh, being on this podcast. One thing I do want to mention to all the listeners is uh, the, this is pre-recorded, so Ron's uh, podcast that he was mentioning that will come out Saturday. By the time you're listening to this, it will have already come out, but definitely do check out his uh, Facebook page, Save the Second, and his group, Friends of Save the Second, and uh, you can check out those podcasts, uh, past and future, on his uh, on his Facebook page. And and, uh, you know, I'm going to try to get down to uh, uh, Missouri in uh, September if I can. It's my goal. I hope uh, we can meet face-to-face. Um, I think all the members who want to uh, uh, improve and reform the NRA should uh, try to get down there. So I'm definitely going to uh, make an effort. So uh, thank you again, Ron, for being on this podcast. Um, that's going to wrap it up. Uh, stay tuned, everybody, for future podcasts. Uh, we've got some great episodes uh, coming up. We're going to be talking to some uh, wheelchair-bound gun owners, um, and we're going to see some of the challenges that they've had to, to face and what their motivations were for becoming gun owners. We're going to have an episode coming up where we talk to uh, some female uh, gun owners as well. I want to see uh, how things uh, is like for the fastest-growing segment of the gun culture. Uh, so as always... Be armed, be trained, and be alpha.